There's a therapeutic edge. And, and, and men are encouraged to love themselves, even in the church. Matter of fact, you can go to any Christian bookstore if there's anything that exists anymore. Yeah. Go to any ministry area of that Christian bookstore, and for every book that you can find on the cross and on the need to deny yourself and to actually walk in the power of the Spirit to obey God, you can find ten books on how to help yourself. Now, if God was really concerned about helping yourself, He wouldn't have sent His Son to the cross. He was much more concerned about crucifying yourself. Yeah. Right? So you have this whole scenario. But then it's interesting, when you get down to verse 9, after Paul describes these guys as self-lovers, as people who would rather be entertained, by the way, they love pleasure more than they love God. They would really be, and, and we're not talking about the world as much as we're talking about the church here. And then it would be those who are ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How could that be? Well, it's very simple. But the knowledge of the truth takes an embracing of the cross and an actual denying of oneself to know truth. Truth is not learned intellectually. It's embraced, my friend. Now, it has to be intellectual. Truth is not dead in, in the intellectual either, but my friend, truth must be embraced within the heart of man where it reverts and changes his very character. You don't know truth just because you can intellectually quote your church's statement of faith or something. That's not truth. That's abstract. Truth must be embraced to know it, right? That's why, my friend, you can never argue a man into repentance. You understand, my friend, that you can never convince a man to know something when his salary is hooked to him not knowing. So you never debate evil with an unconverted mind. It's a waste of time. You're never going to rationally, my friend, convince the world that it should come to Christ. Because it's always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. My friend, when you see Paul talk to Timothy about ministry to these kind of people, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, Never argue or never strive with a man, but to be patient, ready to teach, for adventure God will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So in other words, Paul says, Timothy, it's a waste of time to try to teach them until God brings them to repentance. By the way, just a little side note, that's why counseling never works. Anytime you counsel this person before they go to the cross, they'll merely use your counseling to avoid the cross. They'll master the words without being mastered by the truth. And friend, the goal of the Christian life is not to master the Bible, it's the Bible to master you. Yeah. Right? And so, now that's all introduction, has nothing to do with it. But notice, my friend, verse 9. Paul doesn't say, because, Timothy, you live in this age, you need to confront it. And it's not that he's, a, he's opposed to confronting error. We know that Paul was willing to confront anything at any time. But look what he says to Timothy. Their folly shall be made known to all. Really? Let me ask you this, and then let me answer you. How, my friend, do you condemn the world? Well, when you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and you're reading the great hall of, fame, of faith, remember this. It says that Noah, by faith, built a boat and thereby condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness. Now, what do you learn when you take that verse apart? That if you want to condemn the world, in other words, you want to prove that the world is wrong and that God's ways are right, how do you do it? Well, you don't do it by arguing about whether it's going to rain. You do it by finishing your boat. Then when it rains, you have a boat. If you argue about whether it's going to rain or not, and you win the argument, but you didn't take time to build the boat, who cares? You're going to drown with them. 
That's really what Timothy is saying to Paul. To, I mean, Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, this is the way when it's all coming down, it's all falling apart, and you live in perilous times, here is the way that you endure through that time so that when the storm is over, you are still standing. Because they're going to be proven wrong. Stupidity can only last so long. It will kill itself sooner or later. You know, some of you have met my friend Mark Bloyer back there. Him and I have done construction together off and on for years. And you know one thing about construction? You can argue with the stupidity of building your house on the sand if you want to. But my friend, you don't really have to win that argument. Just build yours on the rock. And when the storm comes, the stupidity of building life upon the sand will, my friend, take care of itself. It will become self-evident as you watch the house float down the stream. Right? So... How do you and I, my friend, in the midst of that, live? How do you, as a father, and I'm going to walk you through this. Now listen, friend. Fatherhood is an interesting challenge. It's never over. You know, I used to think when they turned 18, it was done. Now, if anything, it becomes harder. And the jury is always out on parenting. The only people, my friend, that is, are abs absolutely confident that they're parenting right are the ones with no children and they're writing the books. Amen. That's how come I used to say, listen, if you, if you really want to know how to raise children, find somebody in your church with grease under their fingernails and five godly kids or two or one. They may not know how they did it, but they did it. You don't need a degree. You need a life. And that's really what Paul is saying to Timothy. Now watch this. Thou hast fully known my doctrine. Now what Paul is going to do is he's going to walk Timothy through how to pass on the Christian faith in a way that will stand the test of time. And the first thing he says is thou hast fully known. Now, the real question here obviously becomes, well, how do you make something fully known? Not just you know my doctrine, but you fully know it. You completely know it. You know how it really looks, how it really lives. Thou hast fully known my doctrine. Let me walk you through these words very quickly, I hope. Number one, my doctrine. <laughs> Thou hast fully known the truth. What we're talking about here when Paul uses the word doctrine is he's talking about the clear foundational teachings of Christ, the truth, right? And to fully know the truth. So you start by just basically teaching the truth. Now, I know that sounds so simple, but you and I, my friend, must return to proclaiming the simplicity of the truth of the Word of God. I mean... Sooner or later, friend, the church needs to quit chasing all the new novel ideas that the world comes up with and putting scripture verses to it. Quit Christianizing the world's therapeutic approach to life and preach the word of God. It wouldn't hurt, my friend, to teach it line upon line, precept upon precept, for just what it says. People, I, I'm amazed at people that will come to me and say, well, they not, what do you think that passage says? What do you think that verse means? And my response is, what does it say? Well, and then they'll say, well, what do you think it means? It means what it says. I mean, if God thought he needed to explain it more than that, he would have. It means exactly what it says. And I agree with C.S. Lewis one time when he asked, well, a young man asked him, said, you know, doesn't this verse bother you because you don't understand it? He said, oh, no, it's the verses I do understand that bother me. <laughs> you know, we, we really need to learn to live what we understand. And what I have found, my friend, in 40-some years is if you will live what you understand, you'll understand the rest of it. Amen. Our problem is never understanding. It's obedience. So here we have Paul saying, Thou hast fully known my truth, my doctrine. 
Now look at the next word, because now we're going to get into what's really important, I think. Because he says, my manner of life. Now if you lived in the normal, evangelical, fundamental, conservative church, there would have been a period after dark do doctrine and there wouldn't be anything after that. You can do the same thing if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, Paul describing his ministry at Thessalonica said this, Our doctrine or our gospel came not unto you in word only, but with the Holy Spirit and power with much assurance, much confidence because of the manner of men we were among you for your sake. Mm -hmm. Now hold on. Paul said that what separated his message from just being pure doctrine and gave it the ingredients of the Holy Spirit's impacting power and authority and awakened such confidence in people's lives was the manner of man he was among them for their sake. In other words, the way he lived it out. You and I, my friend, need to understand something. Passing on the doctrines of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not an intellectual adventure. It's a lifestyle adventure. And if you want to build disciples, you have to build them through relationships. There is no such thing in the New Testament as a discipleship class. None. The only thing in the New Testament is discipleship relationships. And you can write this down. The quality of the disciples determined, or the depth of the disciples determined by the depth of the relationship. In anything. Because you're not just after them to understand intellectually your truth. You're after, you're after people to grasp the truth of Jesus Christ. When Paul writes in Titus chapter 2 of the relationships within the church. The relationships within the body of believers. And the relationships that they have with the outside world, he says this. And he, he ends with that relationship with your employer, right? Or slave to master in that day. And he says, thereby ordain the doctrine of God your Savior. Or don't uh, adore the doctrine. You know what it means to adorn something? It means to put it on and wear it in such a way that honors it and brings glory to it. So you and I, my friend, our manner of life is to be adorned by the doctrines of Christ. Paul says, Timothy, you not only know what I taught, you also know how I lived it out. What it looked like. And then he says, my purpose. Now what are we after? See, the first question that should be asked when someone looks at you is, why do you live that way? The idea here is that people who are in the midst of these storms will look around you and say, wow, there's a person who's not moved by these storms. They're not all caught up in all the nonsense of today. They're not all caught up in the political maneuvering of the United States. They're not all caught up in that nonsense. They live this peaceful, gentle, productive life right in the midst of this storm. How do they do that? They see something different here, your manner of life, and it makes them, my friend, ask, how? And why? And now we're at purpose. Your purpose. Now let me say this. If I have to read another book on the purpose-driven something, I'll be driven insane. <laughs> and by the way, you need to burn those books. Because you have the same purpose I have. Every person in this room, if you're a believer, have the same purpose. What is that purpose? Well, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, you know that verse, right? All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The problem is, is when you memorize verses, friend, you need to realize that God loves the one before it and the one after it. And what's the one after it? For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. 
Friend, all things work together for good for only one purpose, to conform you and to conform me to the image of Christ. And the purpose is the same, that you and I would manifest Jesus Christ through our mortal body, whether by life or by death. The issue here is that you and I would be conformed to Christ. You know, the other day, my daughter-in-law sent me to this physical therapist. She probably should have sent me to a mental therapist. But anyhow, she sent me to this physical therapist. And, you know, we were talking. And uh, we're just, uh, where, where was I going with that talk? <laughs> Who knows? But anyhow, we were talking about this idea of purpose, right? And the purpose is the same. I said, did you ever notice anything? When you read the four Gospels, they're the picture of Christ. What is the image of Christ? Now, I'm telling you, if we had four grandmothers or four mothers in here, and we had them write, the bio, four, bio, we had them write four biographies of one of their children, and they wrote four biographies and never put his picture in there, wouldn't you think that was a little strange? I mean, you walk up to any mom or grandmother today and say, if you have grandchildren, the first thing they do is whip out their phone and show you the whole photo. Of them. And then you can read, my friend, the beloved of the father, the biography of his most loved. You can read four biographies of him, written by four different men, and there's no physical description of it. Doesn't that bother you? Doesn't that make you at least, my friend, stop and pause and think? Why not? Well, because if he's going to conform you, and he's going to conform me, and he's going to conform you, and he's going to conform you to the image of the Son by the very things that he takes you through in life, all things work together for good to conform you to the image of Christ, then he doesn't want you to have a picture, my friend, of a physical body and a physical look, because if you did, my friend, some could attain to it and some couldn't. If his son was six foot four and you're only five foot nine, what are you going to do? But if the image of Christ is the fruit of the Spirit, it's a character issue that the Spirit of God, when He's placed into your life, is there, my friends, to work in you, to conform in you. Remember, Paul prays that Christ would be formed in you. And my friend, at the same time, he's talking about you being conformed to Christ. And so if the Spirit of God is forming Christ in you, and He's pouring out Christ through you and your personality, you and I, my friend, have the same purpose and the same goal that when they look at you, they will see uniquely a picture of Jesus Christ poured through your physical personality, soul, all that you are. That's what God's after. That's the purpose. God doesn't care if you dig ditches. He couldn't care less. He cares about you bearing the image of his son. Now look at this. Stay with me. I know I'm, I'm prolonging the act. Stay with me. What's the next word? Faith. Why does faith come in there? Because my friend, Timothy has watched Paul. He's watched him live out this doctrine with this passionate goal to know Christ. And he's watched him and he knows fully this can never be done outside of the, the arena of faith. This is not, my friend, some self-help attempt. This is not memorizing the fruits of the Spirit and quoting them to me every three minutes so I can finally get them. This is trusting in the unbelievable inward dwelling of Christ. My friend, Christian life is lived by faith and faith alone. And what Christ did for me at the cross. Now watch it. I'm going to take you right on here. Okay? Long-suffering. Now why are we getting into long-suffering? We have long-suffering and patience and we have love right in the middle of it. Why? Because my friend, listen to me. Your children, fathers, know more about your actual walk with Christ based on your responses to adverse circumstances and adverse people than they do anything else. 
The word long-suffering here is the Greek word that Paul always uses when he talks about adversity in circumstances. And the word patience here is the Greek word that Paul always uses when he talks about adversity with other people. And my friend, what, what Paul is really saying is, Timothy, you've watched me live this out and maintain this passion. There's nothing, friend. Now look, Paul's not writing to Timothy because Timothy took a three-week discipleship course with him. He traveled with him. Look at the sentence. He's watched Paul, my friend, in shipwrecks. He's watched him in adversity. He's watched him in fasting. He's watched him in persecution. He's watched him respond to this stuff with a heart of love, my friend, in the midst of things that would wear any normal person down. It's one thing to start a race. It's another thing to finish it. This is endurance with joyfulness. This is, my friend, that Christian that's been walking with God for 40 years and they still wake up excited about Jesus. <coughs> this is that believer, my friend, that's been through the bill. He's been ground up a few times. This is the father, my friend, who's, who's tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and failed again. And he still gets up every morning and he still prays for his kids and he still walks with God. He still loves Jesus and other people in the midst of it. This is a 40-year journey, friend. Paul's been with Timothy at least for 20 years. We want to build a disciple in three weeks. We never talked to anybody that's 20 years older and that sort of crying out loud. What would they know? <laughs> <laughs>This is it. You want to know how, my friend, to endure what's happening in your country? Quit worrying about who's going to be in the White House and worry about how you're living in your house. Amen. I walked out of a pulpit here a couple years ago or three years ago. This woman stops me in the back of the church. She has three college-age kids with her. Great-looking kids. Obviously going to have a good education. First question out of her mouth was, who did you vote for? <laughs> well, that's what she was leading up to. She wanted to know who I had voted for. And so we kind of talked around that. She's crying. And I'm not talking, which is very unusual for me anyway. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, she kind of talks around it for a couple of minutes, you know, and she's a sweetie. Loves the Lord. And she, finally, she just comes right out and says, who did you vote for? And I said, you know, rather than tell you that, I want you to know something. God's heart is grieved this morning with you. And so am I. And she said, well, how could you say that? I said, because we've stood here at the back of this church for five minutes while you tried to figure out what my politics are, and not one time did you ask me who I pray for. I said, it smacks of the arrogance of America's conservative Christianity when they believe they have more power in the voting booth than they have in the prayer booth. And they're more concerned, my friend, with somebody's voting life than they are somebody's prayer life. And I said, now that may offend you, but I want you to know you offended God for this. That he would hang his son on a cross to give you access to the throne room of the Almighty God who raises nations up and puts them down and gives them to whom he will. The one who said that, first of all, in the church of God, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, first of all, prayer, supplication, intercession, and giving of thanks should be made, made for all men, especially those who are in authority, that you might lead a peaceful and gentle life in all godliness and honesty. You want to live a godly, honest life that is peaceful? Pray! Paul would have been a preacher in America. He said, first of all, vote. 
That's not what he said. We're more concerned, my friend, about the wrong things. And your children are watching you. Adorn the doctrines of God. We're more concerned, my friend, about making America great than we are God glorious. And if that offends you, it's okay. Burn the hat. I mean it. You want to know what God thinks about that kind of arrogancy? Read Daniel chapter 4 and find out, my friend, why Nebuchadnezzar got sent out to eat grass with the donkeys for seven years. And you'll find it's because he said, is this not great Babylon which I have built? It's insanity, my friend, to believe that you and I, my friend, can somehow dictate the course of nature and nations when we won't even pray to the one who holds them in his hands. You want to be a father that changes your world? Raise children, my friends, who understand those things. They watch you in the midst of all that adversity. And let me finish with this. See, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is teaching on the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God is likened unto a merchant. It was, and I'm just going to do it in the Dane Master paraphrase, okay? Because I do it in King James, it doesn't make any sense, and if I do it in here, I think my idea is obvious, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, here he is. He's this merchant, and he goes shopping. And he's in one of those open flea markets in the Middle East, what we would call a flea market. And he sees a pearl of great price, and he knows what he's looking at. No one else may know, but he does. And so he goes and he sells all that he has, it says. And he took it and he bought the pearl. Then Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a man who's farming and he plows up a hidden treasure, a buried treasure. And he sees it and it's not in his field. It's probably a share crop. And so he knows what it's worth, so he covers it back up. And he goes and he sells everything he has and he goes and buys the field. Now here's the key. The sequence in that story is the key. See, we want people to make a decision and a total commitment to Christ when they've never seen the purpose. Friend, if you haven't seen the pearl and know what the pearl is worth, you'll never sell everything you have to buy it. We try to get people to make commitments to something they've never seen. When they see Christ lived out this way, when you have adorned the doctrines of Christ, then you can ask somebody to make that kind of commitment because then they've seen the pearl. That's the goal. It doesn't always look pretty. For us in this room that have been fathers very long, we know something. You never get it all right. Matter of fact, if, if 40 years of fatherhood has taught me anything, it's how many things I regret and wish I could do over again. That's not the point. The point is not getting it all right. The point here is to maintain this constant walk with Christ that my friend lives itself out in persecution and adversity, in tough times, in good times. It, it's this one. Years ago, and I'll finish with this story because I know I, I don't see a plot, but it's got to be getting close to summer time. Uh, <laughs> years ago, I don't even remember now where I was preaching, pastor or whatever. But I, I, I'm, a, I'm a collector of old books. I love reading. I'm reading all the time, I think. I think. And, uh, you know, I, I actually was in an old, an old thrift store in Medicine Lodge, Kansas one time. A man who we was there with the little kids, uh, actually, uh, at the end of the peace pageantry, we went into the thrift store, and I think she was looking for clothes, and I was looking for books. And so I was at the back, 
and I was digging through this box, I found two treasures, by the way. I found a book written by Donald J. Barnhouse, which is an interesting, I mean, you can still buy this book. But what was interesting is inside of it, there was a personal letter from Donald J. Barnhouse written to this lady that he had met on a flight, coming back from the Kinsley Commission. The book was on how to live a holy life. And in that letter, he talks to her about the conversation they had on the airplane and how he's praying for her. I bought the book because I wanted the letter. But then I found another book, and the book was the 200th anniversary of the Arabian Prayer Meeting. How it ever ended up in the, the, the books of Medicine Lodge, Kansas, I'll never know. But my friend, what it is, is the sermons preached at the end of the Arabian Prayer Meeting. I don't know if you know the history of that prayer meeting, my friend, but it happened in a little church in Germany where God came in such a mighty way that it began a prayer meeting that lasts over 100 years, 24 hours a day, around the clock. started in 1842 at Hearn Hut, and my friend, when that prayer meeting was over, the Moravians would have more missionaries on the field than they had in their church. Literally changed the world. You want to know how impactful the Moravians were? Remember that adorning the gospel of Jesus Christ? My friend, across the Atlantic in a little ship, wooden ship one time in the 1850s, there's a young man named John Wesley who has been to Georgia to build orphanages but has unconverted himself. And on his way back, as he cowers in the bottom of that ship in the storms of the Atlantic, the Moravian missionaries are on the top singing hymns. And John Wesley, my friend, will hear the Moravians and see their incredible joy and faith and say, they have something I don't have. And he will be invited to the Aldersgate Prayer Meeting by Peter Sosa, and that's where he will be converted. The Aldersgate Prayer Meeting was a Moravian prayer meeting. Now, I say all that because, my friend, in the process of going through books over the years, I ran onto the sermon preached by a Puritan preacher in the, 18, or in the 1660s. And I will tell you this to finish the thing, fathers, and for all the rest of us, especially the fathers. This old Puritan preacher, now he had 23 points in his sermon. So if you think you've been here a long time, <laughs> you haven't even started. But he entitled that sermon, Strapped to the mast pole. And he wrote this entire sermon centered around those little wooden ships in the middle of the Atlantic. And he talked about how when the storms would come, and those little old ships, how the world they ever sold them across the Atlantic, I'll never know. But they would take the captain. And they would tie him to the mast pole by the wheel of the ship. Everybody else, my friend, would gather along the sides by the lifeboats. Everybody else would cower somewhere. But there was one thing he knew for sure. That when this boat goes down, there's one guy going down with it. Because he's tied to the mast pole. And you also know something else. You know that, my friend, no matter how bad the storm goes, no matter where the winds blow, no matter what happens here, you know where to find the captain. He's at the master. And I'm telling you, friend, Timothy knew where to find the captain. The real question is, is when the storms finally get your children's attention, when it finally gets your grandchildren, when this nation finally comes unglued and your community begins to fade. When it all comes down, friend, someday they're going to come looking for somebody who had the courage, the perseverance, the endurance to stay at the master. The real question is, is can they find you? Friend, listen, do not, in this age, give yourself to all the causes of the world. And there's some good causes. Don't give yourself to the fads of the church. 
Forget it. That stuff will sooner or later be revealed for what it is. Just make sure that when it finally comes down, they know where to find you. You're still strapped to the cross. They know where to find you. Because they've watched you live this and 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 live this. And, live this. and they know. Everything else may have moved. Everything else may have shifted. Everything else may, my friend, been blown away. We know where to find our dad. We know where to find our mom. We know where to find our grandparents. We know where to find our church. Because it's still strapped to the cross. Friend, believe it or not, they ain't going to need anything else because nothing else is going to matter. Nothing. And it's hard to believe that. And it's hard to stay here in the midst of the storm while everybody else is coming up with fancy answers and, and modern techniques and all this nonsense that we call Christianity. If I had my way, we'd burn it all. And we take the book that you're looking at and we actually spend time and we quit. You, you want to know how, but, but, but what's important is those relationships. You want to know how important this is going to be? Those things after thou hast fully known my doctrine. Do you understand that there was a conference last week in Germany of conservative evangelicals? And at that conference, their worship service was produced and led by artificial intelligence. They actually planned the entire service. They fed in the doctrines they believed, the statement of faith that they had. The AI had access to all those great minds like Spurgeon and MacArthur or whoever you like. They had all of that to pull from to, and put together that worship service, that sermon. They had an avatar, two avatars leading the worship, an avatar preaching the sermon. It got great reviews. Friend, the doctrine was absolutely exquisite. The delivery, the communication was beyond anything I could ever do. There were no flaws. There were no stumbling around. There wasn't those moments when he couldn't remember what in the world he was going to say next. The worship was tied directly to the sermon point by point. People walked out of there amazed. They may have walked out of there amazed, but I can tell you one thing, they didn't walk out of there changed. If you believe that, my friend, those are the things that are important for you as a church, you shouldn't be here, you should be on a computer somewhere because you can definitely get a better message this morning on a computer than you can get from me. If you believe that we can adorn the doctrines of God without the relationships, We could just AI produce it. Friend, God didn't pour His Spirit out on a machine. And He didn't pour His, his well, maybe with me, He's given His Spirit to artificial intelligence because it ain't a whole lot there. But I mean, for the rest of us, my friend, listen to me. When it all comes down, they're not coming to a computer. They're going to come find somebody who's strapped to the cross. They're going to come find somebody that's lived this stuff in the muck and the mire and the disgustedness of this world. They haven't retreated to some ivory tower that you can have an entire conference, my friend. Are you kidding me? Of conservative evangelicals and their worship and their message and everything is artificially produced? You're coming to me. We're artificially producing everything because we don't have the lies it takes to produce it. But you can change that. The good news for you is God didn't pour His Spirit out on a mega church; he poured it out on 120. 
doesn't take a whole lot, bro. It just takes you. And with that, I got to close, got to pray. You need to be going. So do I. Unless God says something different. That's between him and you. Let me pray for us and I'll turn it back to whomever, okay? Father, we just come to you this morning. And Lord, you know I could rant and rave on this stuff forever. And Lord, they don't need to hear me anyhow. They need to hear from you. And Lord, somewhere these men and women need encouragement. They need strength. They need, Lord, life that only you can give by the power of your spirit. They live in perilous times. Times, Lord, that are going to require great endurance. Times, Lord, where iniquity abounds and the love of many is going to wax cold. Their love needs to wax hot for you and for a lost and dying world. Somewhere here, Father, we just need to come back to you and hear from you. And we need to see it live through the lives of those, Lord, that you have put in us and around us. And God, I'm praying for this group of people, Lord, that you would take the few words that I've shared this morning that might be important and you will birth it into their lives. Lord, you would throw away all the nonsense that I've said. Lord, they don't need the husk of Dane Massey. They need the kernels of your truth. Plant them deep in their hearts, Lord, that they might bear fruit a hundredfold. And Lord, give them what it takes to stay until the harvest comes in. And I'll thank you for it in Jesus' name.